You're watching a film about sustainability. And so you might not be surprised to see me walking through this green and leafy park. But actually, this bank is just as relevant to sustainability. And so is this street. And these housing blocks. And this building too, which might be surprising because we've inherited this notion of sustainability as just a matter of being green, as just about being eco-efficient. And while it's certainly necessary to understand sustainability as caring well for the planet, that's not sufficient for a full account of the idea. What the world needs today is an understanding of sustainability that cares not just about ecology, but also economy and society. Sustainability is of course relevant all around the world, but particularly so here in Britain, where geography and culture make it an especially pressing issue. The British people are an island nation, and this has shaped their identity and culture, but it also means special limitations on resources. For example, a significant amount of water, food, and fuel are imported each year. Current social challenges also make sustainability especially pressing. For example, there's a housing crisis in England. Government figures suggest that the rate at which houses are built needs to double, a fact which the housing charity Shelter says is enormously damaging socially as well as economically. As another example, cases of obesity and diabetes are rising in the UK. In recent years, NHS spending on obesity and diabetes is equivalent to the UK's combined spending on police and fire services, law courts and prisons. For example, the NHS spends over £1.5 million an hour on diabetes. That's 10% of their budget. These matters of housing, obesity and diabetes can and should be understood as matters of sustainability. Britain is wrestling with this question of how to sustain a good quality of life. And so why should we concern ourselves with sustainability? Well, because if you really want to understand Britain, you have to understand this issue. But there's another reason that you should, in fact, think about sustainability. Um, a recent report by the Higher Education Academy found that over half of employers had at some time used social and environmental responsibility in their selection of recent graduates and in their questions as staff interviewers. Also, over half said that they will be looking in the future to employ recent graduates that are socially and environmentally responsible. So we should not only think about sustainability because we care about British culture, it's also good for career development. But there's one more reason that we should take the time to think about this today. And that is that there is a significant deficit in the definition of sustainability. We rarely take the time to step back and consider what we really mean when we talk about sustainability. 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 Sustainable. Sustainability. Sustainability. Sustain. Sustainable. Sustainability. Sustainability. In the media and in classrooms, we are often told that we should be more sustainable. But we rarely take the time to critically reflect on what that really means. At best, I think we're often sold a caricature of sustainability that reduces it only to being green, whatever that means. Over the next few minutes, we'll consider the common view of sustainability we often receive, we'll step back and reimagine sustainability, and then I'll share some practical suggestions for how we can really make a difference in our own contexts. So if I asked you to think about sustainability, what would pop into your mind? Perhaps something again like this green and leafy park? Or perhaps something like this? 
Or this. Or even this. We tend to think about things like this because, by and large, we have received a particular view of what sustainability means. That view is that sustainability is essentially about eco-efficiency. It is about being efficient with natural resources so that we humans do as little harm to the planet as possible. This common view doesn't just come out of nowhere, though. It's implied in both Webster's Dictionary and the Oxford Dictionary. However, the primary definition in both dictionaries suggests that actually sustainability is broader and richer than this. So in its first definition of sustainability, the Oxford Dictionary says that something is sustainable if it is able to be maintained at a certain rate. Webster's Dictionary also does not specifically reference nature in its first definition. It says that something is sustainable if it is able to be used without being completely used up or destroyed. The standard eco-efficiency view is valuable, but as a complete account of sustainability, it's insufficient. Actually, thinking about sustainability as a way beyond eco-efficiency enables us to find positive and practical ways that we can make a difference. But before we go on to critique the standard view, we first need to appreciate it because it really is very important. The standard eco-efficiency model goes back at least as far as the 1800s, when painters such as John Constable and Joseph Turner were pioneering an appreciation of landscape for its own sake, and poets like William Wordsworth and William Blake were exploring the natural world. With Blake, we don't just find an appreciation for nature, but a critique of human industry, and one which is perhaps most famously evident in his poem, Jerusalem. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among those dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear. O oh, clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. The British scholar and cleric Thomas Malthus warned most strongly of the potential negative impact of human population growth on the natural world when he said, The power of population is so superior to the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. In the 1800s, this appreciation for nature and concern with human impact was also striking the minds of thinkers in the U.S. Arguably America's first environmentalist, George Perkins Marsh, wrote with a gripping sense of urgency, When I pour cream in my coffee, I am helping to drain a marsh for cows to graze and to exterminate the birds of Brazil. Here we can almost picture Marsh staring out across his backyard, coming to grips with the true impact of his actions. In this period with Wordsworth, Blake, Malthus, and Marsh, we see a real awakening to not just the beauty of nature, but the potentially negative relationship between humanity and the planet. Jumping ahead some 100 years to 1962, the call for humans to be careful with their use of natural resources was championed again by the American conservationist Rachel Carson. Now, uh, to these people, apparently, the, the balance of nature was something that was um, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Well, you might just as well assume that you could repeal the, the law of gravity. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment. You can't just step in with some brute force and change one thing without changing a good many others. In her book, Silent Spring, Carson imagines a world where the use of pesticides has silenced 
that time of year usually full of fresh natural noise. New birds singing, rivers running, and all sorts of plants bursting with a more visual show of liveliness. As you might expect, the chemical industry tried to silence Carson. Miss Carson maintains that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature. Silent Spring was condemned by the press, but Carson's work succeeded in creating great public awareness of human impact on the environment. Carson is an important player in shaping the way that we think about sustainability. Following in the footsteps of poets like Wordsworth and Blake, she too appreciates nature. But she goes one important step further in making a connection between that appreciation and political involvement. Still, it's not till later that the common view of sustainability is fully formed. It was in the UN's 1987 report, Our Common Future, that we came closest to explicitly articulating a view of sustainability as eco-efficiency. That report said, industries and industrial operations should be encouraged that are more efficient in terms of resource use, that generate less pollution and waste, that are based on the use of renewable rather than non-renewable resources, and that minimize irreversible adverse impacts on human health and the environment. It is this understanding of sustainability as eco-efficiency, one which is rooted in a romantic appreciation for nature and a concern with human impact on the earth, that lies behind the familiar slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle. In order to avoid environmental catastrophe, the view goes, we should reduce our consumption, reuse what we can, and recycle as much as possible. So most people know about the three R's, so reduce, reuse, and recycle, but not all people know that it's actually a pyramid where the most impact is at the base. Um, so basically the idea is that reduce has the most impact, and then if you cannot reduce, then you can reuse. If you cannot reuse, then you recycle. And the thing is, a lot of um, people in sustainable fashion, they focus on the recycling and, and reusing, but not necessarily on the reduce. And uh, as, a, as a women's wear designer, uh, I had a label and we did multifunctional uh, pieces. So uh, for example, a dress that you can wear multiple ways. So the idea is to encourage uh, the, the consumer to, to consume less. This more sophisticated approach to the three R's can help us understand how to be eco-efficient. But as we've already discovered, sustainability isn't just about eco-efficiency. In their book, Cradle to Cradle, Michael Brongart and William McDonough point out three limitations to eco-efficiency understood through the beloved three R's of reduce, reuse, and recycle. First, reducing harm does not necessarily end destruction. To see this, consider an example. Now imagine that your boyfriend or girlfriend was caught cheating on you, and not just once, but a lot, like a different partner every week. Now, what would you say if they approached you and said, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to change my ways. I promise from now on, I'll only cheat on you once a month. Would you be satisfied? Probably not. And the same thing goes for the reduction of harm against the natural environment. It's good to be less bad, but it's better to not be bad at all. Second, reusing waste is often championed as a sustainable action, but actually that can transfer toxins. For example, when biodegradable wastes such as paper or food are composted, any toxins that are on that fruit or in that paper are then released into the environment. Third, while recycling is good, it often does not result in the high quality materials needed for manufacturing. For example, high quality steel in automobiles is melded down with other parts, say copper from cables and paint and plastic coating. The result is that we have a recycled steel that is less pure and less strong. In addition to there being limitations with reducing, reusing, and recycling, there's another reason that understanding sustainability primarily in terms of ecology and efficiency is insufficient. Ecology is not the only thing worth caring for. Human rights, social justice, and the dignity of persons are also incredibly important. 
So sustainability is about uh, the triple bottom line. So people, profit and planet. And uh, conventionally, businesses were only focused on the profits. But nowadays, we see the importance of also um, fo you know, focusing on um, ethics and the environment as well. And um, I think everything is interlinked. So if you only really think about one, one side, it's, it's like a tripod, basically. So if the, tree, if the tree legs are not the same length and you, know, you don't put all your energy in the, you know, equally, then uh, there's, yeah, the, the tripod won't stay, won't stay upright. If we preserve the natural world, but do so at the expense of society or economy, is it really correct to say that we're being truly sustainable? Are governments really championing sustainability if they legislate for a reduction in ecological efficiency, but cannot solve the healthcare needs of their people? Should employers be seen as sustainable if they emit zero carbon, but fail to treat their workers as valuable human beings? So if the eco-efficiency view is so limited, then how should we understand sustainability? Well, thinking back to 2012 and the London Olympic Games that happened just here in the East End of London offers what I think is a fairly promising alternative. Those games sought to be the most sustainable games yet. And yes, in the East London Olympic Park, concern was given to eco-efficiency. One of the most iconic structures in the park, the Velodrome, is home to the indoor cycling track. So some examples of sustainability within this velodrome include natural lighting and the use of the roof, um, natural air conditioning in which the environment self-regulates instead of having to use electrical air con, um, and also the use of sustainable resources and materials. So the roof, for example, is reclaimed wood, 100% sustainable and resourced. The Siberian pine on the track itself is also sustainable um, according to uh, international laws and governance of, of sustainable modelling for wood. This means that the venue is perhaps considered the most sustainable of all the Olympic Park. There are eco-efficiency initiatives like this all through the park. And yet that's not all that made London 2012 a highly sustainable Games. Prior to the London 2012 Games, the area of East London was noted as an area of social deprivation. Uh, there was job seekers uh, allowance issues and also health and obesity epidemic was on the rise, much more so than areas outside of this um, part of London. This meant that this was the ample time to have something like London 2012 to regenerate the area, not only physically, but in a sense socially and culturally give aspirations to the younger generations in which being involved in the building of the infrastructure um, and also being a part of this community after the games meant that they had a sense of new identity. An example was utilising the Games Maker programme, which was the volunteer programme for London 2012. So during the games time, volunteers were needed. These were called Games Makers. And these included um, over 10% of the Newham area recruited for this role. What was great about this was the way in which volunteers were trained meant that they had tangible skills after the games itself. They were able to have the experience of being part of this great mega event, but at the same time, for example, unemployed and unskilled workers were trained in the build-up to the games and actually received MVQ Level 3 in business administration. What the London 2012 Games offer is a different perspective on sustainability, one that's not just about eco-efficiency. What they show us is an understanding of sustainability that is holistically effective. It's holistic because it's not just concerned with ecology, but also economy and society. And it's effective rather than efficient because it's not just concerned with doing less harm, but with making a positive impact. Compared to the eco-efficiency view, this understanding of sustainability as holistic effectiveness, which we see embodied here at the Olympic Park, seems revolutionary, but it's not actually new. Again, in Cradle to Cradle, Brongar and McDonough champion holistic effectiveness. In their words, when it comes to sustainability, the key is not to make human industries and systems smaller, as efficiency advocates propound, but to design them to get bigger and better 
in a way that replenishes, restores, and nourishes the rest of the world. Importantly, understanding sustainability in terms of holistic effectiveness doesn't just challenge our approaches to consumption and waste. It also makes us step back and question the very assumptions that we bring with us about humanity. Do we assume that human impact on the earth with each other is necessarily bad? Or are we more hopeful? Are we open to the idea that actually humans can have a positive impact? You'll, you'll hear people talk about being carbon neutral. Well, why would I want to be carbon neutral what, for one more kilowatt hour, 13 cents? I would be energy positive. Isn't that something? You're that close and yet you don't see the idea that you could be positive. You're still in the mind frame of being bad and wanting to be less bad or zero. We hate zero as a goal. Zero is not a goal. When you hear all these people talking about zero emissions, zero emissions, that's not what nature does. You don't go down a street and look at a tree and go zero emissions. You'd be telling the tree to stop making oxygen. That's ridiculous. We want positive emissions, not zero emissions. And we want positive energy, not zero carbon. Um, we, want, we really want to frame each question in a positive way and get on with the design so it's practical and fun. The failure of the be less bad approach is a failure of the imagination. In fact, understanding sustainability in terms of holistic effectiveness does demand more creativity from us. And that's because it's not just about doing less harm to the planet, but it's about doing more good in all the spheres that we inhabit. In his book, Cities Are Good For You, Leo Hollis imagines the leaps we have to take as a species to live more sustainably on the Earth. Being sustainable is not just about being green. It's not just about fabric and buildings and infrastructure. Being sustainable is something that is beyond that. It's social and it's human. It's about how we come together, how we behave with each other. So where do we find the solutions and the new ideas for the sustainable future of the city? Housing is going to be incredibly important. Finding new ways to bring people to live together in new living arrangements. Transport, obviously, is going to be absolutely essential, not just getting people out of their cars and onto bicycles, but also public transit. So, for example, in Bogota, they were using a bus system, the Transmileno, in order not just to get people around the city, but also to bring people together in order to encourage equality. There are other interesting solutions, such as urban farming, getting food supplies into the heart of the city, Water is going to be incredibly important and water equality so that everybody has access to these vital sources. Another thing which I think is going to be incredibly important um, is actually access to the internet, to the Wi-Fi. This is going to become one of the key battlegrounds for equality. If you imagine that in a place like London or New York, still about one in four people do not have access to Wi-Fi or the internet. This creates a new level of inequality. If we construct a society that reduces its carbon emissions, but cannot care for its sick or find ways of sheltering the homeless, can we really say that we have made a society that is fully sustainable? Or, as an example that is a bit closer to home, if we buy local, organic produce, we may be helping the environment. But if we go into debt doing so, are we really living sustainably? It's one thing to conceptualize sustainability in terms of holistic effectiveness, but it's another to actually enact these ideas. Beyond the 2012 London Olympic Games, where else has humanity found success in manifesting holistic effectiveness? One example comes from the U.S. in Washington State. The Janicki Omni Processor is a machine that positively impacts ecology, economy, and society. Over two and a half billion people have no access to safe sanitation. We asked brilliant engineers to help us solve this problem. And one of those engineers actually has proposed a solution where the waste is valuable. The Omni Processor turns sewer sludge which is kind of nasty, into clean drinking water, electricity, and ash that is pathogen free. This is where the sludge enters the machine. It goes up this conveyor belt, is fed into these large tubes we call the dryer. That's where we boil the sludge. And in the boiling process, we separate the water vapor from the solids. 
The solids are now dry and we can feed them into the fire. Once we have this very hot fire, we can make high pressure, high temperature steam. And we take that steam and we send it to a steam engine. And the steam engine drives a generator that makes electricity that we use for the processor and also excess electricity that can be delivered back to the community. The water vapor that's created in the boiling process is run through a cleaning system until we have the cleanest, purest water you can possibly imagine. The sanitation system as we know it in the developed world cannot work in developing countries. So what we need in developing countries is a very simple system. The entrepreneur that owns this processor will get paid for the input, the sludge. And that same entrepreneur will get paid for the outputs, the electricity, the water, and the ash. I am very impressed with this solution we're seeing here. It generates electricity, it generates clean water. It will grow to every corner of the earth that needs it because it makes money every day. It's water. Another initiative modeling the viability of holistic effectiveness happened right here on Villiers Street in London. It was designed and implemented by Hubbub, an organization finding creative and collaborative ways of being sustainable. We are looking at new ways to tackle littering behaviour. Engage people in an issue in a way that is positive, fun, and encourages people to look after the streets that they live and work on. Villiers Street is a real melting pot. It's made up of a lot of commuters, tourists. There is quite a vibrant night economy. Over six months, we've got a range of different installations and competitions running on Villiers Street. My Street is Your Street poster gallery shows the faces that make up people who live and work on Villiers Street. We've also got a talking bin which thanks you for depositing your rubbish. We had a flash mob called Message Bin a Bottle where we celebrating people who took the initiative to put a piece of litter from the floor into the bin. We've also got Gumdrop, who are an organisation who recycle chewing gum. They have key rings which you can use on the go to put in your chewed gum. They are then collected and can be recycled into lots of products. We have a chew by numbers display where you put your chewed gum on a cross and it builds up a face of a character who is from the area. Hubbub is an environmental charity who's looking at fresh new creative ways of communicating different environmental issues. Give people a reason to take care of the place they're in and help them understand the environment that they're in. Litter doesn't have to be boring, it can be fun and interesting and that's what we're trying to do. Villiers Street is just one street in a massive city. We hope that this is going to be a model that can be replicated and we will share the results of what is successful from this project. We want this to be a catalyst for greater change on a bigger scale across the country. The London Games, the Janicki Omni Processor, and Hubbub's Neat Streets campaign are all inspiring, large-scale initiatives. But they don't tell us what we can do in our day-to-day -day lives to really live out holistic effectiveness and make a difference. The first thing we can do to make a difference is to be our own gadfly.
Now, a gadfly is a fly that's just buzzing around and it won't leave you alone. Mm -hmm. um, and when we're being our own gadflies, we're doing that mm -hmm. same sort of thing to ourselves. We're pausing to ask ourselves questions mm -hmm. about our assumptions. You know, how sustainably am I really living? Um, what do I really understand about sustainability? Those sorts of questions. And by being our own gadflies, we're really walking in the same footsteps as the classical Greek philosopher Socrates, who called himself a, a, a gadfly, actually, because he walked around the dusty streets of Athens and um, asking his fellow Athenians, why do you behave in the way you, way you do? Uh, what do you really know for sure? What do you believe? Thinking again about the triple bottom line, the three Ps of people, planet, and profit, we can ask ourselves how we relate to others, to the earth, and also to money. Or we could ask, what impact does our work have on those things? Or how could we improve that impact in each of those areas? The second thing we can do if we really want to make a difference is to engage in something that the British thinker Roman Kaczmarek has called starting an armchair revolution. <laughs> The idea is to sit in our armchairs, lie on our couches, uh, whatever it might be, and read books, watch films, engage with podcasts, really just anything that's going to help us engage with sustainability. So, you know, sometimes we might need to get out and do something, and that's right, but sometimes also it's good to step back and consider what's really going to inspire us, and that's what we do when we start an armchair revolution. So a great thing to practice is to seek out sources of inspiration. Ask your friends and family what books, music, podcasts have inspired them recently. Our sources of inspiration don't always need to be explicitly about sustainability. Rather, they might just be something that helps us really care about some part of holistic effectiveness. For example, I recently read Roger Deakin's book, Waterlog, that tells the story of Deakin swimming his way around Britain's oceans, rivers, ponds, and pools. And I loved it. It wasn't about sustainability, and he probably didn't even use the word sustainability in the whole book. But it got me thinking about water, the way I interact with it, and about ecology and sustainability more widely as well. So we might want to ask ourselves and even our friends questions like, you know, are there any books or films, podcasts that um, have really sort of struck you and inspired you to think about sustainability in a new way? If we're being our own gadflies, starting armchair revolutions, in addition to other things we're already doing, like recycling, reusing things, and maybe other initiatives, pretty quickly it can feel like there's a lot that we have to do to make a difference and be sustainable. Um, and that can be pretty overwhelming. And actually, it's probably more important to make sure that our sustainability is sustainable. And so sometimes one of the first things we need to do is just take a step back and consider what's one small thing, or maybe just two small things, that we can do so that we're really being ourselves, only different. For example, we all need to eat. Why not be a part of something like the People's Supermarket in Holborn? It's a grocery store run by the local community that sells delicious food and wonky vegetables. Those vegetables that are just as good for you, just as nutritious, but maybe the other shops pass over because they're sort of a funny shape or not quite as visually appealing. This approach means less waste and better connection with the local community. Broadcaster Christopher Cook has an insightful approach to changing our habits. A simple analogy would be the fridge, full of half-eaten dishes, things that we would actually throw away because we've got bored with the food. We have to learn to think about everything being in there potentially changeable and reusable in a different kind of way when we next want to eat. And I often think that fridge metaphor is very helpful when you apply it to other things too. We don't necessarily have to throw away everything in our houses to replace it with what is new. We have simply perhaps to rearrange our houses in new and different ways. Lastly, if we really want to make a difference, we need to follow our hearts. Now, when I say follow our hearts, I don't mean some sort of sickly, sweet, romantic, vague intention, but rather a careful consideration of how the things that we really care about intersect with sustainability. To understand this, consider the story of Dan Barber. Dan is the chef at Blue Hill Restaurant in Manhattan and Stone Barn Center for Food in Pocantico Hills, New York. He is viewed as a proponent of sustainable agriculture, but actually, as he explains, his ethics and sustainability initiatives stem from his excitement about flavor, not some initial concern for sustainability. The great things, the great thing for chefs, the great blessing for chefs, and for people that care about 
food, and cooking, is that the most ecological choice for food is also the most ethical choice for food. Whether we're talking about Brussels sprouts or foie gras, and it's also almost always, and I haven't found an example otherwise, but almost always, the most delicious choice. So rather than thinking about the kinds of things that we might need to give up and uh, approaching sustainability with a sense of sort of scarcity, rather we can approach it with more generosity and consider what are the things that I really love and how can I do those in ways that are more holistically effective. Yeah, personally, uh, I, I have this rule that if I if I buy a piece of clothes, and but I'm, I don't intend to wear it at least 50 times, then it's it's not worth it. Um, so I think if you just buy it for one occasion, you might as well hire it, uh, or you know rent it rather than than buy it, or, or you could borrow it as well. And so there's a lot of alternatives to buying as well. I suppose there's a real sense in which we feel that. Sustainability is about making awkward choices that are good for us. Um, in a way, all of us know that that's the worst possible motivation. The best choices come from things that we passionately believe in and we want to do. And it's how you rediscover sustainability in ways that make your life better and you start automatically practicing it. I think food's a very good example here, uh, and so is exercise. Food in the sense that food that is grown properly, organically if you're lucky, uh, grown by yourself if you're even luckier, will quite frankly taste better. The beans that you pick from the plant and put straight in the pot will be better than the beans that have flown all the way from Kenya on an aeroplane and have been wrapped in cellophane you bought from a supermarket. Okay. Secondly, you will also understand that walking has not only the pleasure of taking exercise, but it also has the pleasure of what we sometimes think of as the flaneur, gently walking, seeing where you're going, looking at the world around you. This becomes a pleasure so that once we get away from the idea of injunction, you have to do this, and once we develop the idea that there can be pleasure associated with all these things, we'll be in a much better position. Once you've begun to practice being your own gadfly, having an armchair revolution, being yourself only different and following your heart, what concrete actions can be taken to live in ways which are holistically effective? Well, of course, I don't know what it's like to be you, uh, what your passions are and your talents, and so I can't tell you how you ought to live. But here are a few practical things that can be done to contribute positively to ecology, economy, and society. We've already learned about the people's supermarket. And actually, food and drink is an excellent area to find concrete ways to be sustainable. Now, of course, buying locally grown organic food is excellent for the environment, but it can get expensive. And if we're trying to balance uh, being positive ecologically and economically, then where can we recoup some of those costs? Well, an easy way is to grow a few of our own vegetables, even if it's just a few tomatoes in a window box. But even easier is to buy a water bottle or perhaps a travel coffee cup so that we never have to buy a bottle of water again and actually get discounts at many cafes, not to mention reducing our use of plastics and cardboard. Another way is to eat more communally. Cooking large meals for several people with simple ingredients will usually cost less, um, always uses less energy, and can also foster a greater sense of connection with others. In fact, sharing is one of the best ways to be holistically effective in many areas of life. For example, with travel, carpooling is a great idea. My, this is nice. Really nice. Oh, hi. It feels so good to be amongst some friends. Hey, uh, Ron, what is this, a private club or something? No, we're pooling it. A fan pool. It's like a carpool, but a little bigger. And we leave the driving to Gus. Right, Gus? Another area of life where sharing really makes a difference is our use of physical space. So we might join a community garden, or more radically, create our own by tearing down the fences in our backyards and sharing that space with our neighbors. Again, creating a greater sense of community. If you like reading, then using a library is a great way to spend less on books and reduce your consumption of materials and energy. And of course, while you're here at FIE, there's also the Student Switch Off Initiative, which is another way to reduce energy consumption while having fun with friends. So there are concrete ways that we can have a positive impact, 
But if we are to make our lives holistically effective in our own context, and therefore sustainable, then we really need to think about how our own choices affect our impact on ecology, our connections in society, and our own personal finances. The 21st century is going to continue being a time of great change and huge challenges, and that can be scary. But it also brings with it a great opportunity to truly make an impact. And you and your generation can be the pioneers, innovators, and leaders that our future so desperately needs. When I was at Yale, a very, as a student, a very, very, very famous architect, um, came what was teaching there and he came over and he looked down at my work i was designing the first solar heated house in ireland as a earnest student doing my best and nobody else was talking about these things so there's nobody to go to really and we had a couple of professors who were interested in these things but you know it was really wasn't part of the world still isn't of the design world it's just starting um still but anyway he stood looking over me and he's supposed to be my you know mentor and, and guide and he looked at he said young man Solar energy has nothing to do with architecture. Can you imagine? There were only two of us in that class that were really thinking about this. And, and it was a real breaking point for me because I had to realize I have to break away from what it means to be a, a, a known thing in the architecture universe to a place that we're going to that's now unknown, but so attractive, so delightful, so hopeful, so rich and so generous and so, so full of goodwill instead of some arcane, egoistic focus on positioning and place in, in a profession or you know, in a community. I think that my own generation have been rather late to wake up and think about these issues. What I do find encouraging is that the younger generation, people perhaps in their 20s and even a little earlier, are much more aware of all these issues. And I think they're going to find it therefore relatively much easier to think about how to change the way they live their lives. And we who are older have much therefore to learn from them. We need to watch them because there are things they can know and can do that we need to be able to know and do as well. <laughs> The city sets the pace. What is thought and said in today's city will shape tomorrow's world. And to city dwellers, now approaching one third of mankind, the city is the world. So it is that here, in the midst of his most dazzling creation, Man most quickly forgets just how earthy are his real origins and how basic the elements on which his true wealth depends. Well, here we are in the city, in tomorrow's world, at least in relation to that clip from 1971. But the same is still true, of course. What is thought and said in today's cities will shape our world of tomorrow. So this is an extraordinary time to live in cities. The 21st century is the century of the city. At the beginning of this century, the world became for the very first time 50% urban. And by the end of this century, it will be close to 98, 99% urban. Therefore, we have an opportunity here to set the future. And sustainability is one of the absolutely key aspects of this future. When you look at London, uh, particularly if you live in the centre, it's very hard to believe things are changing. But when you look at the periphery, when you go out to the East End, to Hoxton or to Shoreditch, or when you go north uh, beyond Hampstead, you see things are changing. Firstly, there's a kind of a proper value assigned to open space. And people are planting trees again. Uh, and there are kind of shared gardens. And above all, even in London, there's a, an enormous waiting list for people who want allotments, who want to, these small spaces where they can grow their own vegetables. So there are positive signs on the edge. What we have to do is bring the edge into the centre, you know, the great commercial centre of London, and see that these things can hopefully apply here as well as on the edges. So why not get started right now, today, on creating a better future for you 
your friends and family, and all humanity.